Hello YouTube. Uh, one area of antiques which has fascinated me since childhood, since I was about six or seven years old, has always been the area of antique writing equipment, antique writing instruments, antique uh, writing accessories, all the little knickknacks that used to be uh, part and parcel of the experience and the event of writing. And over the years I have amassed a pretty big collection of antique writing equipment and I am going to show you some of it and to give a brief look into the evolution of writing instruments from the uh, early 1800s uh, up to more or less the modern day. So what we have in front of us is a late Victorian era gentleman's writing box. This is from about 1880. It is made of wood and it is covered in very thin layers of black Moroccan leather. Uh, writing boxes like this were very common from the 1600s all the way up until about 1900, 1910. And the reason they were so common was because in those days, if you wanted to write with ink, you could only do it by using a dip pen. Uh, there were no such things as pens which carried their own ink supply which you could use anywhere. If you wanted to write with a pen, you had to have a pen, you had to have a pen holder, and you had to have a bottle or a well of ink. Uh, so to carry all that stuff around and to make writing comfortable, they made boxes like this. And uh, you can see the silver dip pen there on the bottom uh, with the steel uh, pen point in place. They were replaceable. You could just yank it out and throw it away when you were done. Uh, you could buy them in boxes. You would pick it up, you know, like a box of a hundred uh, steel pens for just a few cents. They were like the throwaway ballpoint pens of the 1800s. Very, very cheap. And for a long time, that was how people wrote. Things changed because of the invention in the 1880s and 90s of a new writing instrument. And that writing instrument was the reservoir fountain pen. So I have here a small selection from my collection of antique writing instruments and these basically chart the early progress of the fountain pen. So in the 1880s, 1890s, 1870s, early 1900s, you are still getting pieces like this. And what we have here are two dip pens from the late 1800s. One is solid sterling silver. The other one is sterling silver and ivory. This one is about 1875 thereabouts. This one is 1901, so this is right at the start of the 20th century. Uh, they don't have nibs in them, I've taken them out. 
um, but what you would do is you would slot the pen points in here and this is little spring here to hold the uh, pen points in place so you would slot them in there and pens like this remain very common in places like libraries, banks, schools just because they were so cheap they were so easy to use if you broke it it didn't matter because like I said the boxes of pen points cost next to nothing so they still made these for a while in the 1900s, 1910s uh, but they were mostly for public use by the early 1900s you start getting fountain pens and they are pens like this and this and what we have here, this is the oldest fountain pen in my collection and uh, here we are so this is a Swan eyedropper fountain pen from about 1900 1900, 1895, 1905, around that 10-year uh, gap. And it's called an eyedropper pen because there is no way of filling the pen using the pen itself. You have to unscrew it here. And in here, you fill it with ink using an eyedropper. That's why they're called eyedropper pens. And when you bought these pens brand new, uh, they came in a box and they came with their own eyedroppers. And so you would fill it up with ink and you would screw it shut like this. It's very secure, it doesn't leak. And you would have a full pen of ink to carry around and write with. And it was a great convenience to just have this in your pocket. Instead of having to lug around this huge heavy damn wooden box it was a game changer this is the first time this has ever happened and the thing is why did it take so long for the fountain pen to be invented it's such a simple stupidly simple thing it's just a gold nib in a holder with a barrel and a cap it's so simple why did it take so long it took so long because they did not understand how the fountain pen works. The fountain pen works on air pressure. What happens is, you have ink in here, it flows out here, and you write. Now, as ink flows out of the pen, air has to go out into the pen to balance the air pressure. If the air pressure isn't balanced, the pen doesn't write. This is why fountain pens leak on airplanes, because it's all about air pressure. And because early inventors did not understand this, early fountain pens, really, really early fountain pens, like the 1880s, 1890s, they would leak or they wouldn't work at all. You know, there, it was one of two things. It would either, the pen would not write at all, and it was useless, or the pen would write so well that the ink would be pissing all over your sheet of paper and it would leave a horrible black mess everywhere. And so they came, they overcame this uh, thanks to Lewis Edson Waterman who invented the first practical fountain pen feed. Before that they were doing all kinds of experimentations like with this one. This swan made in England in about 1900 has what's called, a, it's a very early feed, you won't find this on any other pen. It's called an over, under, or double feed. You have a feed on top, you have a feed underneath. And that is to compensate for the feeds of the day. Early feeds did not deliver enough ink, the pens would run dry. So they used pens like, they used feeds like this to deliver enough ink to the nib so it could write properly. And for from about 1890 to about 1905, 
eyedropper pens like this were all the rage, and they're all black. They were made of a substance called ebonite, also called hard rubber, and they said, you know, it's, it's like Henry Ford. You can have any pen you want so long as it's black. Uh, because they couldn't, they didn't have the technology to make pens out of anything else in those days. And so to make the public buy these pens, they would do all kinds of things to do. They would cover them in gold and cover them in silver and put pretty decorations on the, on the rubber when they made it. They would do anything to try and sell them. And so, by about 1900, 1905, you have what are called the first self-filling fountain pens. And self-filling fountain pens are pens which you don't have to fill up with an eyedropper, you don't have to make a huge bloody mess, you, all you need is a bottle of ink and the pen, and nothing else. Maybe a, maybe a tissue paper to clean it up afterwards. And this is one of the first self filling fountain pens. This beautiful piece, it's still made of hard rubber, it's still covered in all the little decorations and the gold bands and everything. This is one of the first pens, it came out about 1900, and it is called the Conklin Crescent Filler. It's called Crescent Filler because it's got a crescent filler bar here. And how this works is inside here there is a rubber sack I know there's a rubber sack because I put the sack in there myself. I fixed this pen myself. And how it works is you have a rubber locking ring. You turn the ring like this. You press down on the crescent. The crescent presses down on a bar. The bar forces the ink sack flat, forces the air out, sucks the ink in. You have a full pen and no ink on your fingers. How wonderful. Okay. Now, the Conklin Crescent Filler was one of the most famous pens of its day. Uh, one reason it was so famous was because uh, the Conklin Pen Company got really smart and they decided to do celebrity endorsements. And what celebrity th did they get to endorse this pen? Someone called Mark Twain. Mark Twain used to use one of these pens and a Conklin Crescent filler, and he wrote glowing reviews of this beautiful self-filling fountain pen. And he said, it's a wonderful pen. You can carry it with you anywhere. You don't have to worry. It doesn't leak. It doesn't break. And it doesn't roll off the desk. And he said, in one of his testimonies, he said, I love this pen because it is a savor of profanity. Because what would happen? He put it on his desk to think about a story plot, and it would just sit there, it wouldn't roll away. If he had something like this, a dip pen, and he's riding around and he stops for a minute, and he puts it on his desk, what would happen is this, it would just roll off, fall on the floor, probably break, spray ink everywhere, and it's a bloody mess. And he hated it. And he said, this can sit on your desk, and it doesn't move. So, you're never going to lose it. Now, one thing you may notice with pens like this, or this, or for that matter, this, is they all look roughly the same. They're all black. They all have gold markings on them. Really pretty. Uh, this one actually has nine carat gold bands on it. Ooh, fancy. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that there's no clips. Early fountain pens did not come with clips. Um, just remember, this is a really experimental thing that they're doing. They, they had no idea what they were doing. You know, there was no manual saying, this is how you make a pen. So, what happened was, they thought, well, should we start putting clips on our pens? You know, you can put it in your pocket, it won't fall out. And so, one of the innovations they came up with was this thing. This is exactly the same as this pen here. It's black, it's hard rubber, it's got a gold band on it, uh, it's a lever filler. Hell, they're even the same length. And what makes this pen different is that it has a clip on the cap. And 
you will know you might you might think oh you, you know you could go out and buy it like this and in laser pens you probably could but what happened was this is called an accommodation clip if you went to a pen shop or a stationery shop you would buy the pen and then you might think I want a clip for it and so you would buy the clip separately and slide it on and it's called an accommodation clip because it accommodates the pen cap and allows you to just slip it into your pen pocket like that. Really cute. By the early 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, the fountain pen was quickly becoming a status symbol. Remember, these were very expensive in their day. They would cost three, four, five dollars, which in about 1910, 1905 was a lot of money to be spending on a writing instrument. You know, especially when you know, you could pay five cents and buy a box of cheap throwaway nibs. You know, it was a lot of money to spend. And so they tried to make the pens really flashy. And this is one of the flashiest. This is, like the others, it's a uh, eyedropper fountain pen from about 1910, probably. 1910, 1915, probably pre-World War I. And it's got a clip and it's still hard rubber but it is covered in 18 karat gold. Uh, I bought this at a pen show, it cost me, I don't know, it was like under a hundred bucks and you can see here, probably, anyway somewhere on, the, somewhere on here is the hallmark for 18 karat gold. And so these were the sorts of things that pen manufacturers were trying to do to make their pens really flashy. Uh, another example is this. This is a Wall Eversharp lever filler from the early 1920s. And as you can see, it's covered in gold. Uh, actually, it's not. It's brass and it is rolled gold or gold filled over the top of that. And uh, I mean, can you imagine in 1925? going to a pen shop and buying something as beautiful as this. And like all the others, this pen works. Uh, all my pens work, I fix them myself. And yeah, so this is the sort of pen that people were using in the early 20th century. Then in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, pens started changing again and the thing was, it was the first time that they really started um, adapting to uh, design trends of the day. So by the 1930s, fountain pens started adapting to all kinds of changes and uh, one of them was the rise of Art Deco. And uh, Art Deco was all about angles and lines and curves and, you know, you have pens like this and it's really cute, but it's really angular. You know, it's just, it stops here, it drops off, stops here, drops off. Uh, even the Greek key decoration is very angular. Uh, it's all part of the styling of the 1920s. By the 1930s you have something called streamlining coming in. Everything has to be sleek. And so they started inventing rounded pens like this. So it's nice and round at the end. Nice and curved. Nice and cigar shaped. Uh, this is a Parker from the late 1930s, 1940s, same with this. Uh, you might, at first glance, you might say, oh, these pens are identical. They are not. Uh, there is a very big difference, and I will show you what that is right now. In the heyday of fountain pens, there were all kinds of filling mechanisms. Um, you could use an eyedropper, you could use a lever filler, you could use a crescent filler. Uh, this one, is a button filler. 
You take off the cap at the end of the pen, you press down the button, that presses a spring inside that deflates the sac, it sucks up the ink, and then you screw this back on. If that's too fiddly, you have something like this, which is a squeeze filler. You take off the cap, you unscrew this a bit like a modern fountain pen, you take it off, and then in here you have the rubber sac. And there's no ink in here, so I can just squeeze this and it will depress like that, pop out like that. Okay, there's a bit of water in there, whatever. Uh, and fill the pen. So it's really, really easy. And that was more or less where fountain pens stopped. I mean, there was, you know, there were a few changes, a few more fancier um, filling systems. And in the 21st century, you know, companies like Visconti and uh, Conway Stewart are really trying to bring back the vintage filling mechanisms. You can go out right now and you can buy a modern uh, fountain pen, which is a crescent filler. Um, you know, it's 100 years old and they're bringing it back. You know, everything old is new again. Uh, so the final evolution in fountain pens was something like this. This is from about... 1995, 2000, and it is fountain pen with a modern cartridge converter inside it. And so there we have it. Um, if you want to know anything about the history of fountain pens, anything about how to clean them, how to look after them, anything about the history of writing instruments, uh, you can leave a comment or you can visit my blog. There is loads of information about this stuff on my blog. Um, it has been one of my pet subjects to write about for over two decades. So um, there's not much which I will not know about this if you have any questions. Uh, yeah, thank you for, thank you for watching.